Hey guys, my name is Mavi and I've spent the last 14 years in the plastic surgery and beauty industry, working alongside top board certified plastic surgeons. Now I'm an independent patient coordinator who doesn't work for any surgeon. This means I have unbiased reviews for hundreds of doctors and I can help you achieve the look of your dreams, whether that's a supernatural or a video vixen. I use my professional and personal plastic surgery experience to help you look and feel your best. Join in on the fun as I talk to plastic surgery experts, friends, and real-life patients about all things plastic surgery. Should be fun. Hey guys, do I have the show for you today. I'm super excited to have a very special guest with me today, Dr. Matt Nichol from SoCal Plastic Surgeons in Newport Beach, California. Hello, Dr. Nichol. Hey, how are you? Nice to, nice to meet you or see you again from the meeting, and thanks for having me. I am very happy to have you on. And the meeting he's mentioning, you guys, I, let me tell my girls, I went to the aesthetic meeting a few weeks ago and I got to meet Dr. Nichol in person. It was amazing. The conference was so good. I learned so much. It was so much fun. How, how was your experience? It was great. Also, that's my second time. Uh, it was in Vancouver. Uh, so that's my second time being there. I, I, I love Vancouver. Just a, a great place to visit. And then um, it's always great getting together with uh, fellow colleagues, um, just going over different ideas. We get to meet uh, new people to the industry, um, like yourself. It was great, great run into you at the uh, uh, marketplace and, and just talking with you. So it's overall a great experience. Love it. I love it. I have been going to the conferences for a couple of years. I've taken a lot of their patient coordinator courses. I've taken a lot of the classes that they offer, and I've always loved it. So being able to be there with a booth and it's something that we came up with. It was just really a really amazing experience. I'm so happy I was able to do that. And I feel like at the, these conferences, you guys share a lot of information about what is happening in your practice, right? That's right. Yeah, that, I would say that's one of the major things that we do is always kind of like, hey, what's 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 new? What's the trend? What are you guys seeing? What information can we share to help each other out? I love that. So today for our topic of losing weight before or after a BBL, I want you to share with us everything that you learned. I know I saw some some slides at the conference about fat transfer and the modalities, the technicalities of whether the fat will take or not. So I think it's really interesting. My girls love to hear that type of stuff. They love learning. So why don't you tell us a little bit about losing weight with the BBL should you wait until after surgery, uh, after your BBL to lose weight? Should you lose your weight before the BBL? Kind of let's run through that. Well, thanks. And I think it's a super interesting topic, especially in today's current era, because with the sort of uh, the GLP-1 medications, which is your semaglutides and your terzepatides or your Wagovis and Mongernos, weight loss is actually attainable now for a lot of people, right? And not just a little bit of weight loss. 20, 30, 40, 50 pound weight losses are within within grasp, easy for people to do. And that's just something that we didn't have before. Um, so I think it's a, a really great question because if you're thinking about, okay, I want to use volume to get my butt bigger or rounder or more shapelier because uh, in general, if you just sort of pull up or tighten skin on your butt, a tighter butt makes a flat butt. It makes a square butt. It makes a lack of a shape. So adding that volume really is what helps give you roundness, perkiness, shape, et cetera. So what's going to happen if we take get rid of the volume? I think it is, is that next question, right? So this is sort of the art versus the science of medicine uh, that's existed for all of us, which is there is no single answer for everybody, right? So I think we can give uh, these generalizations that for the most part hold true, but you're always going to have to get a consultation, check with your surgeons, double check what I'm saying with with your local surgeon, because I think I think that matters, right? And, and it's not sort of a cop out on this answer. It's just, hey, it's the art versus the science that every every person is a unique individual. So, pre the GLP ones or pre these amazing weight loss medications, we would say, listen, we want you to get down to relatively your goal weight, because um, we want to sculpt you at relatively your goal weight. And what I mean by relatively is it's okay to be five, ten pounds above maybe even 15, we have some good fat, we can suck it out, we can work on diet exercise afterwards, right? Um, but now with these medications, people are able to lose, like I said, 
30, 50 pounds, and we can get to points where we can lose substantial weight and not have enough fat left to, to even, you know, even do a fat transfer. And that's just something that has not been, I think, an issue in our current society, right? Or in our current um, BBL plastic surgery practice. Era. That's right. That's right. It's a, it's a new <laughs> chapter, right? Where does that leave us? Like, and, and my thoughts are this. If we are talking about losing 5, 10, uh, 15 pounds, yeah, I think let's get you down to your goal weight, right? If, if, if we're still going to have um, a fair amount of fat left and we're still going to have to do more sort of diet and exercise after, great. We can take it. We can take that lipo. We can take that fat. We can shape it. And then we can add the volume. In my practice, I'm really more of a shaper in BBLs. I, I think I really focus heavily on creating a nice shape and a nice frame. Uh, I'm not so much about huge volume, more, more about just, I think, a, a very elegant shape. And I like to sculpt you closer to your goal weights um, because I think that that's, it just holds better. I think it looks better. I think we're getting you more towards your goals. Now, if we're talking about losing 50 pounds and we're talking about going from like, you know, 170 to 120 or 180 to 130, I'd say, well, we probably need to meet with each other somewhere around that 140 to 145, 150 mark, just to, just to have a check in to see how much available fat is left. How are things looking? Um, what do we need to do? Uh, Cause we, we physically need enough fat in order to make a change that's worthwhile. Again, can differ a little bit on people, smaller frame people, less fat. If we're just trying to fill in a little hip dips, we need a little less fat. Uh, it really can change, but I think in general, that, that's kind of um, how we've approached it. I love that answer because it's very, each person has their own, you guys hear me say it all the time, you're on your own journey. What worked for one person might not work for you and what worked for you might not work for them. So it's very important for you to trust your plastic surgeon. I want to go back to what you just said a minute ago about how you're more about shape than volume. I would love to really dive into that because I think there was a while where there was a lot of women who were just looking for a lot of volume. I'm more of shape than volume too. So I would love to really talk about that. And I think that this uh, is a little bit, again, from a different skew. You know, I just said from our standpoint, from a surgeon standpoint, it's the art versus the science of medicine. Like we wish that it was the exact same for every person. We wish that we could control healing for every person. We wish that like the post-op was the same for every person, but it's just not. It's the individuality uh, that makes our job both frustrating and cool at the same time. And I think that that holds true from a patient standpoint, right? It's the art. It's the individuality of it. To one person, they may not care as much about the shape. Uh, to another person, they may care more about the volume and that's all they're interested in. And I would totally agree with you. I would say probably sometime around 2017, 2018, probably about last year sometime, I think volume was the main driver. And, and I think it was the main thing people were interested in. And still within that, we had a lot of people come to us because they weren't as interested in volume, more interested in, in shape and just sort of um, figure sculpting. Um, but we got a lot of hate too at the same time from people saying like, I would never go there. I want, I want bigger volume. I want more volume. And I, and I think we're seeing a little bit of a, like anything that sort of pendulum swing and we're swinging more back into the baseline, which is, uh, in, in the middle, I think, which is just, Hey, volume's not so much of the issue. It's more just sort of, we call it body balance at this point in time. So we want to balance the body, um, especially in women. We want to really balance hips, shoulders, waist, um, and really try to see how we can create a more just more feminine or just more aesthetically appealing um, shape, uh, really kind of hit goals right. And that focuses on that sort of body balance shaping. Uh, in my mind, I think BBLs um, are a lot of addition by subtraction, right? Like I think good lipo helps to set up a good BBL result. Absolutely. And actually that leads us right into our next question, which was something that I want us to talk about, which is liposculpting with Vaser versus with MicroAir? Because I saw on all of your stuff that I think you do both. I do. So um, I do that. It's so in full like, disclosure, I'm I'm a I'm actually an international trainer for Vaser, uh, and I'm actually an international trainer for Renuvion, which is a skin tightening device. Um, so I'm not a trainer for for MicroAir. Uh, this gets in a little bit in the weeds, but I hope I can break it down for everybody um, pretty easy. So. Uh, if you think about it, liposuction has gone through a, a number of uh, technology improvements. 
first off, originally liposuction honestly was done with a syringe by hand and somebody was just like pulling on the syringe and moving the cannula back and forth. And that took a ton of effort. It was really hard to even focus on trying to shape somebody because it took so much energy. The next thing is somebody hooked up basically the cannula to a vacuum, right? And that vacuum helped to suck the fat out. Significant improvement, but still required a lot of energy. Uh, just you just moving back and forth. And with more energy, there's less time to focus on the art, right? So then somebody said, well, wait, if I take that cannula uh, or that, that hollow tube and we put it on a motor so it kind of moves itself, which is what a micro air is, it's power, and that takes a, that gets rid of a lot of the energy necessary and we can start actually focusing on sculpting. And we did. Power Lipo, honestly, is by far and away, I think, one of the best advances to liposuction. And I think if you talk to anybody that does lipo enough, they're going to be like, oh, yeah, I have power lipo because it's just a necessity because it, it, it just helps to decrease the amount of energy that you, the surgeon, has to expend so you can focus more on sculpting. And while power lipo works great, it has some limits. It can't totally break that fat up. It just can't sometimes get through some of the, the connective tissue um, or that collagen. It, it just can't break through it as well. And that's where ultrasound or vaser lipo really started to come in. Those ultrasonic waves basically, through super cool processes, make make fluids bubble and then the little bubbles actually break the fat up uh, and then that little fat actually releases. So now we're able to actually get into places that we weren't uh, able to get that fat to break up and we can. So now we get this fat to really break up. We've got power lipo to suction it out and we can really start to focus on sculpting. And so when you look at the surgeons, I think when you look at them just objectively, you're like, hey, that person does a really nice job lipo. They made a really nice change. Almost all of them have vaser ultrasonic lipo, and almost all of them use micro power lipo. We found that that unique combination just really helped to get us um, a better result. And then, you know, sort of we we started running into issues of we had a little bit of skin laxity because we were sucking out so much fat. So that's when we really brought Renuvion radio frequency body type as sort of skin tightening devices on. I've heard from other surgeons how the new generation of technology has really opened the door for less scars on some patients when they don't maybe they're that in-between patient like between a tummy tuck and a lipo yeah. and you're kind of like eee, you could go either way tell me a little bit about how you're seeing that yeah so it's actually super cool um and again i'm, I'm a trainer for renuvion so there's two main and i just say that for for all your listening audience um I always wanted to declare if you have any bias. So I, I, I am a trainer. I'm paid for by Renuvion um, to go train other docs. There's two main types of skin tightening devices on the market. There's body tight and there's Renuvion. So um, like we just talked about in that prior segment about how great the combination of ultrasound and power can work, what most of us were running into, the problem was not that we couldn't remove enough fat because we could. It was the issue of what's happening with this skin now. There, there's just a limit on how much skin can tighten. So that was really the first huge advance that these radio frequency um, skin tightening devices allowed us. Typically, we see about a 30% tightening in the skin. Um, in really good cases, it can be 60%, but I always tell people, hey, just focus on 30%. And so now we were able to actually suck a lot of fat out, sculpt it, and also get that skin envelope to tighten. So I think that's huge advance number one. Huge advance number two, you're absolutely right. We would have two groups of patients come in where they were in between this tummy tuck and lipo. And you'd say, you know, you're really not a good candidate for lipo because we've got a little bit of loose skin and you're not really a good candidate for tummy tuck because you've got, you don't have enough loose skin. You're just, I would recommend waiting. And, and that was it. That's kind of what you said. I just recommend wait, come back. We can do something later. Now with, with skin tightening devices, we're able to lipo, we're able to get a nice change. We also have another group of patients that just kind of had just skin that that just had a little bit more stretch to it, right? Just some people have really tight, firm skin and other people don't. That's just the unique individuality of us all. Those individuals, you'd say, yeah, you know, your skin quality isn't the best. I'm not sure how great you would respond to liposuction. And now by being able to add in these radio frequency devices, we say, listen, you got a little bit of, of looser skin, just that's naturally your quality skin, but we're actually able to get this to firm up by about a third and improve the overall skin tightness and also reduce fat. So it's been a, an amazing change to our industry. And again, BBLs, I think um, well-shaped sculpted BBLs really are a procedure about balancing the body and addition by subtraction or sucking all that fat out, really sort of setting yourself up to then add volume and, and create a nice shape and that waste of 
uh, to butt to hip hip ratio. I love it. Thank you for explaining that so well. I can see the ex the expertise behind that. I want you to. Is that to... code for I talk too much? Is that what that is? No, I can. <laughs> Yeah, no. my, my team's nodding their head behind me like, yeah, you talk too much. <laughs> no, I want you. Okay, now next topic, I want you to yeah. talk a lot. Talk a lot, okay? Okay. All Give right. us the tea on butt implants. Okay, so, uh, well, I, I can, oof, we can talk a lot on this. Um, but I know, I'm gonna try, go for it. Go, I'm going to try and break it down. Because we've never talked about it. Okay, so a couple things that we just have to address. Number one, we did butt implants before we did BBLs. Right, we stop doing butt implants because they they can have some complications. And the and the main thing I want you to think about is most surgeons were comfortable with breast implants. They're, breast implants, straightforward, easy procedure, very easy to do. Lift up, lift up the pec muscle, goes below the pec muscle. You can pretty much squeeze big implants in the breast, and the breasts naturally stretch out and squeeze out because that's what breasts are meant to do. They're meant to engorge with milk. So a lot of surgeons took those same ideas. And then went over to the butt implants and started putting them in. So, well, I can just, I'm just gonna squeeze in this big butt implant. I'm gonna put big butt implants in. Uh, and what they found was that doesn't work because you've got to sit on your butt implant sometimes. The butt isn't meant to naturally squeeze and, and increase in, in volume that much. Uh, and so, what would happen is um, it could actually break down the incision, they could become exposed. If you weren't uh, with that, the, the proximity to the anus meant that you have a little bit increased risk of infection. If you use really big butt implants, uh, you could actually risk flipping an implant. Any implant can flip, um, but a butt implant is flat on one side and round on the other. So if it flipped, it was a problem. So all these things made a lot of docs say, I don't want to do these anymore. And then the BBLs came out right around that same time. And at that time, we were injecting fat into the butt muscle. So what the butt implant was able to do was implant goes in the muscle basically lit, pushes the whole muscle up. So it naturally creates that perky, round, muscular looking butt that gives volume. The BBL, when we were injecting fat in the muscle previously, right, it made a big butt muscle. It made a really nice result. It was a great result. And at that time, a lot of people probably said, well, hold on, I'm getting great results injecting fat in here. I'm not coming through with the same um, risks that I have with a butt implant, uh, whether I can't go super big, um, if I do, I can run into some problems. I think I'm just going to be done with the butt implant and then move on to the BBL. Um, the other thing is a butt implant's a harder dissection because it's got to go into the, I'm sorry, butt implant's a harder dissection because it's got to go into the muscle. So all these things made people say, you know what, I'm done with butt implants, I'm just going to do BBLs. And obviously, as we know, um, there were issues that came about with injecting fat into the butt muscle, fat embolisms, you know, issues of, of if even not fat embolism, just fat embolized syndrome where people would end up in the hospital, but you could also die from uh, the fat being injected into the muscle. And so that's kind of flipped a lot of this equation. So we started putting fat back above the muscle. But one of the negatives about putting fat above the muscles, you don't have a ton of space to put that fat and the skin doesn't stretch because in the old school BBL, when you put the fat in the muscle, you'd be pushing that muscle up, which would naturally just push up your whole skin increase the volume. But when you're trying just to put fat in the skin itself, there's just a limit how much that skin can stretch because nothing's pushing it up. And so butt implants have naturally sort of come back around. Uh, and I really long talk, really long answer to that, but that's why you've seen this paradigm shift a little bit from everybody's like, no to butt implants. And they're like, hey, you know what? Butt implants aren't so bad because when you compare them to the risk profile, butt implants actually say, well, hold on. They do do a really nice job. Um, and, and they're not coming with these risks of fat emboli, et cetera, when we inject in muscle, and there's just limits to how much volume we can put in the butt above the muscle. So what are the key things that you need to know about if you're looking to get butt implants done for, for your viewers? So that, that, was, that was kind of my, and listeners. So that's sort of my first half of like, hey, look, this is why you're seeing butt implants come back. So it's not all bad. Okay, key takeaways. Number one, go to someone that does butt implants a lot. Now, there aren't gonna be many of us that actually do butt implants a lot, that's just, truth by the numbers. So if you can find someone that honestly does one butt implant a month, you're actually beating out 95 to 99% of the plastic surgeons um, in the US. Um, so th that's number one. Number two, make sure that you're, uh, at least in my opinion, be again, these are my opinions, uh, I think butt implants do better inside the butt muscle. Uh, we've done them both above and inside the muscle, and we find that the butt implant is best when it's in the muscle because that muscle just basically helps to act as a sling to help hold the implant up and, and helps to actually hide the implant. The next thing is you have to understand butt implants are 
completely different from breast implants. So a butt implant is a firm implant. Breast implants will squish down, and you can do it if you ever play with them. You put your hand on them, they'll squish down. They, they actually, they look a little bit smaller sometimes in, in diff when people have a lot of breast tissue weight. Butt implants, that's not the case. If a butt implant is sticking out this much, it's gonna push your butt out that much. I kind of call it, usually we say, tell people a butt implant acts like twice as big to a breast implant. So if, if you were looking at like a 300 cc butt implant, that's going to function similar to like how a 600 cc breast implant would. And that's just kind of been um, what we found. We have to respect the width of your butt. So there's very limited sizes on butt implants that match each pe person's butt width. Breast implants, that's not the case. We have, a, we have honestly pages of breast implants that we can match to your size of your breast. That's not true for butt if, implants. So we want to use a butt implant that fits the width of your butt. If we do something too big, it's going to look weird, it could stick off, or it could potentially not fit in the incision, and that's not good. So those are the key takeaways that you want to know. You want to make sure that you're not using too big of a butt implant. The common size butt implant that we use is about a 275 to 350 cc butt implant. That's, that's it. But it functions a lot bigger because you hear those numbers, you're like, that's small, but you see a lot push out of it. The second thing is we got to use a butt implant that matches your butt width. I really believe that in the muscle, is better, I think it gives a better result. Um, and you wanna go to someone that does butt implants frequently. And frequently simply can mean like, hey, if they're doing 10 to 12 butt implants a year, they're doing more than than almost everybody. That's, that's so true because it's hard to find a surgeon that does butt implants and does them uh, confidently and is like, confident about the results. I know I've sat, I've heard of some surgeons saying, yeah, I mean, I'll do it if they really want it, but it's not like something that they really uh, like to do or enjoy doing or, or find, um, I guess, exciting, <laughs> but they, so they don't. The complications that come out from them probably cause them more of a headache than actually doing the procedure and I think a little bit of it too was just, you know, if you trained as a plastic surgeon, let's say in the past 10 years, right? You really weren't exposed to that many butt implants um, because they just weren't being done. BBL's fat transfers were. So unless you uh, specifically spent some time learning butt implants, you really don't have, you really weren't, weren't trained in it per se. Now there's a lot of things that we learn after the fact, but it's just something that is a new concept to so many uh, people that it's not, I think when you get that response, they're like, oh, I can do it if you want. It's just, they really haven't been exposed to it. And, and so I think that's how, when you're not exposed to it, you get a response like that. Like, yeah, I, if, if they want, I, I can do it. Um, but yeah. if you've got them and you've seen it, you're like, yeah, no, we can do it. If we do it appropriately, we can use it for, for really thin people um, or people that want a little bit more of, of a pronounced volume or people that are really flat butt that you're like, how much can we really expand this? They're great answers. I love to hear that. I have another thing that I want you to talk about, yeah. which I'm super curious about. I saw on your feed the BBL vacuum in the OR. Yeah. Tell me about that. It's, it, we do a lot of cellulite uh, treatments, right? Like, Because, like, again, I think once you get a, a BBL or butt implant um, done, um, you're loving your results. I think it's always in, you're just staring at your butt more and you start to notice uh these things and cellulite's one of them so naturally i think if you do if you're doing a lot of bbls or butt practice cellulite's got to become um one of the things that you treat because it's going to help your patients and, and so that's what we started doing we've actually developed some really neat techniques uh for cellulite and it and it, it works i think there's a lot of myths out there that cellulite treatment doesn't work it does it's just sometimes we got to treat more than once and so that's why people i think sometimes they're like oh it doesn't work it just sometimes you got to pop it out more than once and one of the devices we use during cellulite is we put a vacuum suctioning device kind of looks like a big cupping device right and it and it sort of pulls that cellulite band a little bit so i can pop them um we sometimes got to use that in like really hard cellulite cases uh and one day um we were doing it and we kind of thought well i wonder if this would help stretch that skin out and give me a little bit more volume to put the fat in. Because all of us struggle now putting fat above the muscle, but hey, can we get enough space to put that fat in? And so we tried it. And what we found was the results were good. They do use a similar device like this when they do fat transfers to the breast. It's called a Brava device. And one of the things that studies showed that is it, it increased blood flow to that area. And as kind of I'm sure all, everyone knows that's listening here is that fat transfers Sometimes they can take well, sometimes they cannot take well. In my opinion, that's really due to how much you're off your butt. But one of the other issues of sort of fat taking is, does it get a blood supply? Does it actually transplant into the tissue surrounding it? And so one of the ways we can get that to actually improve is 
increasing the blood supply. And we know that actually vacuum suctioning it does it. Uh, and there's been studies done on it with, with fat transfers to the breast. So um, we found when we were doing it, we could get a little bit more fat in and that our results were just a little bit better. Um, and it's super easy to do. It takes us a couple minutes. We just vacuum suction the butt um, before we inject that fat. And, and we're, we see a nice change from it. Again, just all these little things that you're trying to do when you're injecting fat above the muscle. I love to see the innovation. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's a long, again, another long answer, but I don't want to run you through like, because you're like, how, did, how do you, that's what I would think if I was listening or watching. It's like, how did you decide to put a, a suction device on somebody's butt? And that's kind of how we sort of got to that point. You know, I love that the problem solving though, you're like, wait, this works over here in a different way. I wonder how it would work if we did it over here. And it turned out it worked out great. Yeah, it did. It did. It was awesome. So before I let you go, I yep. have one more question. Well, two, actually. My first one is a one I, I ask all my surgeons, and that is if you are team drains or no drains. Oh, I got I got such a long answer for you on that. <laughs> but it's a good story. OK, okay so go originally I was originally I was team no drains, 100 percent team no drains. It's like, no, you don't, we don't need like just oh, leave them open they'll drain get some chucks actually um also we would recommend patients even like the puppy pads because you could get puppy pads for like substantially less than than these medical you know sort of chucks <laughs> they're the same thing um and then you know, yeah it's a yeah, terrible 24 hours just a lot of fluid drains out but, but, but you'll be fine and then i did the surgery on my wife and so i was taking care of her uh in a hotel and i was just kind of watching all this drainage come out and uh, you know, her, her sort of in these chucks is all this fluids. Come out. I, I, a lot of people, a lot of surgeons still do it. And I used to do it. And I just thought, this is gross. Like, like this is, no, I'm, I, this is, I, I'm grossed out and I'm the surgeon, you know, kind of like with all the fluids. <laughs> and it's true. So honestly, the day after I went into the OR, I was like, guys, we're putting drains in. And everybody kind of looked at me weird. I was like, it's just, it's going to be so much cleaner. Um, and also we get the drains out at the following post-op visit. So like we just, we take them out right away. It's just for those first, you know, eight, 12, 24 hours. It just helps collect that fluid. It keeps things so much cleaner. And I think overall, it's just a better experience. I don't think it has any impact on the results at all. Um, I do think it just makes your life as a patient better. And it's what I would want if I was a patient. I love that answer because I'm team drains. And I had, I, my surgery, I had drains, but I've worked with plastic surgeons who had, who did drainless and that, I mean, it is messy. And I, I think it's funny because a lot of, uh, in one episode I did uh, with Annalisa, uh, maybe two seasons ago, we were having a talk about this and she's like, oh, but you know, it's, it's better, it's cleaner. And then I'm like, no, it's not, you're draining. You're draining out of your out of these little puncture holes and it's getting everywhere. She's like, oh, but you can use puppy pads. So this is really interesting because it it is you still drain. It's not like you're not draining. The fluid still it's still there. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It's it's amazing. Yeah. It's just amazing how much of that tumescent fluid comes out. And it's just so much cleaner. You know, what I mean, it's just clean. Just I, I think it's cleaner. Better because it. it you don't get it on your on your garment so you're not wet so then you're not uncomfortable and then the bed i mean like that 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 you know i mean like the whole thing like then you don't have to worry about like what about your sheets what about your clothes what what about your you know your furniture it's just it's just cleaner it's just better it is it is i love it so good answer okay so my next one is and my oh, last okay. one all right is if it was your wife or your sister, I guess your wife already did it. So maybe your mom, your sister, your best friend, somebody very close to you who was considering having a plastic surgery procedure and they're just about to get started on their journey. What is one tip that you would give them? One tip, one tip that I would give them. I talk so much and you've, you, you've pushed me down on one tip. Okay, you can make uh, it to, you can make it as yeah. many as you want. Um, all right. So, well, okay, I will. So, so, uh, all right, so this is, these are my tips for people wholeheartedly that I feel. Number one, you've got to be doing plastic surgery for yourself. If you're doing plastic surgery for anybody else, and I mean that in, in all sincerity, if you've been in a 10-year marriage, if you, and you're just kind of like, I don't have that same spark, I'm going to do this because I hope that my partner will show more interest in me. I can pretty much guarantee you you're going to walk away unhappy because you're not doing it for yourself, you're doing it for somebody else. You've got to do it for yourself. 
Um, number two, look at before and afters. I think before and afters are great. And, and there's nothing wrong with saying that you don't like before and afters or you do. Honestly, we just put up an a Instagram post with, that focused really heavily on, on sculpting, shaping someone, nice change. And we had you know two or three people hating on it like, hey, there's not, I would never, the butt's not big enough, not enough volume for me. Great. But very happy that you're able to see it. I'll try to be respectful all the time when you're in these communities, but, but great. Know what you like, know what you don't like. And if you see a surgeon um, that makes art that you don't like, and because it is an art versus science of, 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 of medicine, don't go with that surgeon. Like, even if you like them personally, we, we have a lot of people sometimes be like, hey, I saw your videos, you're great, I wanna go to you, I just don't, I, I, I like a different look. And I say, then don't go to me because I'm not, I'm not the person. I, I, I appreciate you want to, but go somebody that makes the art that you like, that, that really resonates with you. Number three is you've gotta like your surgeon. And what do I mean by that? Well, it, it, it goes a couple ways. You have to have full confidence in your surgeon and you have to also like them. Complications can happen to, and they will happen, to anybody. It's, it's a nature, it's an inherent nature of what we do, which is surgery. And you want to have full confidence that when a complication happens, um, that you trust your surgeon and that you like them. Because if you don't really like your surgeon and, and you have complication and you're going through this period that's harder, it's, it's not going to make your life easy. It's going to make your life harder. Those would be my main um, sort of, I think, things to kind of, kind of go over. I love that. Those were really great tips. The last one is really important because I and I talk about this on the show all the time about how complications can happen. And what's important is knowing that the surgeon that you are with is going to hold your hand during that whole process. And that's super important. We always talk about that on the show. So I love to hear it coming from the doctors as well. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think it's just it, it's it's just you know, un unfortunately, one of those inherent things that happen, and, and I can guarantee you, you know, speaking as I have family members that don't go to plastic surgery and speaking as a surgeon myself, no one wants complications to happen. Like, I, nobody wants it. It's just sort of, okay, here we are. What can we do now to kind of get us through this and, and try and, you know, in some ways make lemons out of lemonade, make lemonade out of lemons. Uh, just really, what can we do together, work forward, try and put us both uh, on, on a path towards the goals. Absolutely. Cause I want to, I'm, I don't want to go too long, but I do want to give this example of imagine you're after surgery, right? You just had a tummy tuck, for example, and you have drains and you have all of these, you're sore, you, you're nauseous. And let's say you, maybe something happens in that first week post-op where you're starting to see, for example, maybe your, your incision is looking dark or you're maybe in, scared of an infection and now imagine that you can't get a hold of your doctor you can't call your surgeon because the communication from the from the beginning of the whole process was bad They're, they don't answer their phones or they don't get back to you or they never call you back or something like that so now imagine you're after surgery and you're not getting calls back. You're afraid. Maybe you're traveling for surgery. Now you're going to go back home. All of these things snowball all, all one on the other because the, the flip side of that would be you start having doubts and you have such a great relationship with your surgeon that you can call them and tell them what's going on and somebody answers. And if you do have to come in, they tell you come in to see us if it's something hey, you're, it's totally normal, you're just a uh, healing process, then you already know it's the healing process and you can move on with your life. But not having that ability to, I don't even want, I don't know if the word is problem solving, but like to have a, an, a solution. Like, hey, look at this. Is this, is this normal? Am I overreacting? Do I need antibiotics? Do I need to come in? Like what's going on? Versus you're still feeling all of those questions, but you can't get a hold of anybody. It's the opposite. You can't. Should I come in? Can you write me a prescription? Can the doctor call me back? I need to come see you guys. That's the different reality of having a surgeon that you have a good communication and relationship with versus having a surgeon that only sees you for the surgery and you don't ever see them again. I think that's a good point. And, I, and I, I'd honestly say just for, for your listeners, I'd split that up in the, in the two things um, just, to, just to give you. So one of those is absolutely like interpersonal sort of relationship, right? Do, do you have a good working interpersonal communication relationship? And if the answer is no, like you feel friction every time you talk to the individual, you just don't get along with them. And that's not. Um, I think sometimes 
in general, we, we sort of shy away from saying that. Like, that's totally fine. There are personalities of people that get along well together, and there are personalities of people that don't get along as well together. Great. If you find yourself when you've met a surgeon, um, and even if you're like, I love these before and afters. I love what this person does. I love these results. And then you meet and you're like, I just don't get along with this person. You really want to take a step back and say, wait a minute, is that a good choice? The second part of that is if you find um, that you cannot ever get in touch with the office, no one will um, call you back, no one will respond to you. I'd say that's a, that's a good indicator too, right? Uh, to give you an idea, like every one of our, every single one of our patients gets my cell phone number. It's just directly my number. It goes, it's right to me. Um, they can text me, call me whenever they want. Um, it's part of that sort of that, that sort of that concierge treatment, but it's that, it's that direct line of communication um, once you are that surgical patient of like, hey, it's really important we stay in communication with each other. And here's our, here's, here's my number. Here's my cell phone number. I know not every surgeon has to do that, but um, you just want to make sure that's a great question when you were kind of asking also to circle back on the journey. Like make that one of your questions. Hey, how do I get in touch with you guys after surgery? How do we keep in communication? Because I agree with you. There's many stories of um, sort of clinics, et cetera, um, where kind of you can't ever get in touch with anybody. And that's not good. That's not good. And it the patient journey is really affected. So I'm glad that we're talking about it today and I'm going to continue talking about it. And it's something that I'm very passionate about, educating my girls, my audience about what to look for, what, what are red flags, what are green flags, and talking to different plastic surgeons on the show and exposing the surgeons to my girls so that they can get to hear like, hey, this is somebody that um, I respect and I admire what they're doing and how they run their practice. And it also kind of sets as an example, like, okay, this because this is something I've always said, just because that's how they do it doesn't mean that you have to accept it. So if just like, meaning, oh, this is how they do it. You don't get to meet the surgeon that you only get to meet them the day of. Yeah. You don't yeah. see them like just because that's how they do it doesn't mean that you have to accept them and that, uh, that you have to go there because you, you love the results. There's a lot of plastic surgeons that can deliver amazing results and give you the bedside manner and take care of you. Yeah, and it, going back to the journey, I, I, if my family member said they went somewhere and they weren't able to meet the surgeon until the morning of surgery, I'd say, no. <laughs> That's just, I, people do it, I'm not saying it's wrong, but if my advice, I'd say no, don't, 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 don't go to that person. Don't go to that person. I think we couldn't leave leave off on a better note. Thank you so much, Dr. Dr. Nichol. For you did such a good job. I you did great on your answers. Not long, not not uh, long winded at all. You did great. My staff is laughing back behind us. I just want to know. <laughs> They're like, okay, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, uh, sincerely, thanks so much for having me. It was great meeting you at the meeting, and it was. I'm so happy we were able to sync up uh, and, and do this. Thank you. Thank you, and we'll have you back on in the future, and Love let's it. pick a good topic. I would love it. Yeah, let your let your audience decide and, and we'll talk about whatever. I love yeah, it. Yeah, that would be good. So that's the episode for today, you guys, and I'll see y'all next week. So if you're listening to this episode and you're listening to the Big Butts No Lies podcast, you might be on your surgery journey. And if you are and you don't know what to do, you don't know where to start, you've come to the right place. I am so excited to do one-on-ones with you guys. I've realized as I do them more and more just how valuable they are to you, not only because you get my expert opinion, I get to guide you towards plastic surgeons that we know are going to do a good job and keep you safe. Besides all that, I get to talk to you about things that might not even be on your radar, things that you don't even know are possible. But since we get so in depth with our conversations and I really get to know what your dreams are and what you're really looking for with your body, I can tailor my recommendations to the surgeons that I know can help you achieve that. And taking the guesswork out of who to go to is invaluable. So schedule your one-on-one phone call with me. You can go to my website, go to the quick links, submit your information. Let me get to know you. Let me see how can we help you. You can get your own team. You guys, I have been working so hard behind the scenes to come up with a perfect way for you to have your plastic surgery and not only come out with beautiful incisions, but also feeling beautiful on the inside. 
So book your call with me and take the guesswork out of your plastic surgery journey. And don't forget, new episodes every Monday. I'll see you then.